And so to our main event. As a disabled person who identifies as non-autistic neurodivergent, autism and masking was really insightful for me, not only in explaining the concept and the consequences of masking or camouflaging, as it's some kind, sometimes called, uh, but also how it differs from the way non-autistic people like me may consider that they might mask in terms of things like putting on a happy face at work when you don't feel very happy. The book defines masking as a social survival strategy used by autistic people in situations where neurodiversity is not understood or welcomed. And it looks at the complexities that lie behind it. It combines the latest research with personal case studies detailing autistic experiences of masking and delves into the psychology behind masking, including the toll it can have on mental and physical health. And I'm delighted to say that all three of the book's authors are joining us today. Dr. Felicity Sedgwick is an academic based at the University of Bristol, whose work focuses on the overlap between social and developmental psychology, rather than sitting in one specialism. She's carried out research into gender differences in autism, autism and relationships, and autism and mental health, as well as how all those areas interact. Dr. Laura Hull is an academic who looks at factors impacting autistic people's well-being and access to support. Her previous research focuses on understanding the concept of masking and developing ways to measure masking. And she's currently conducting research into the mental health of autistic children and teenagers. Helen Ellis is an autistic adult who was first identified at the age of 15 and received a clinical diagnosis a week before her 22nd birthday. She works in the human resources team for the National Autistic Society with responsibility for diversity and inclusion as well as leading on the internal mentoring scheme, coordinating autistic representation on interview panels, and delivering the understanding autism session to MPs when they ask for it. Without further ado, I will pass over to our authors and presenters to take us through their session. Hi, everyone. So uh, that's been a brilliant introduction. Thank you, Ollie. Um, we're here today to talk a bit about sort of where the book came from, why we thought it was important to write it, and some of the things that we cover in it, and then, uh, as Ollie said, to answer questions. So if we can have the next slide. This is a very simple graph that explains kind of exactly why we thought it was about time that there was this book. Um, this is the Google Trends uh, graph for the search autism and masking or autism masking um, and you can see that since well since about 2015 there's been a couple of spikes of interest and then in the last two or three years interest has absolutely exploded in this topic and that's very much been driven by autistic people themselves talking about the fact that they engage in masking the impact it has on them and researchers catching up to that community conversation. So researchers starting to be better at listening to autistic people, listening to the things that are important to them and that they say is having a really big impact on their, their mental health, their physical health, their life experiences. Um, and researchers starting to carry out studies to try and look at some of those anecdotal stories in a more systematic way. So the Kind of the big papers on this really do come from the last few years and um, they very much do agree with what autistic people are saying yeah as we'd expect um, but it's always nice to have oh thank you I was coming to that uh, it's nice to have that kind of um, confirmation that this is a broad experience a shared experience it's not just a few individuals who have had a really intense experience who are talking about it um, and this is just a sample of a few of the papers that have come out uh, looking at this so um, people talking in qualitative studies about how 
masking feels like, putting on their best normal, trying to um, fit in and very much that social element to masking and feeling that it is about how you appear to other people, not just how you feel within yourself. Um, other papers have looked at trying to measure the strategies that people use. So the paper from uh, Lucy Livingston um, and also looking again at things like the motivations for people of autistic people of different ages. So again, uh, the paper from uh, Anna Cook and her team finding that actually for autistic girls, a lot of what drives their masking are those social motivations. It's wanting friends, it's wanting to fit in with the group. There's also um, a work coming out now from autistic autism scholars looking at how we conceptualize masking. And that uh, paper from Amy Pearson and Kieran Rose that came out last year uh, is a really powerful account of how we think about masking, how we write and talk about masking and how it plays into other emerging areas of autism research, such as understanding um, the stigma that autistic people face and thinking about how much of a choice and when there's a choice for people to mask or not, which is something that we uh, talk about in the book as well. And then the final paper that I've highlighted on this screen is um, looking good but feeling bad. And it's that paper looks really clearly at the links between um, masking and mental health. So we know for from research that masking has a really big impact on mental health and that's something that we'll talk about later. Uh, but I just wanted to highlight that that kind of phrase, that looking good but feeling bad, really sums up the experience of masking for a lot of autistic people. It's the idea that no matter how you're feeling, you put on this mask. And actually sometimes, particularly when you are feeling at your worst, is when you feel the need to mask that the most. Um, so that, as I say, is something that we talk about in the book. And I'm gonna hand over for people to start talking about some of that in more detail. Uh, okay, so um, I'm just going to take you through what the four different types of masking are quickly here. Um, the first one I want to talk about is what we call instinctive masking. So this, um, and you'll have to forgive me for the use of the photos, I'm very much driven by what I can relate to myself. This is what I kind of describe as a bit like the, the Spider-Man spidey sense of you just suddenly know something has happened something is is going on that you need to be aware of that you need to be perhaps scared of but you don't you don't quite know what it is so you go into that instinctive fear response of hyper vigilance to be very much something's happening and I've just got to be aware of it we've then got your subconscious masking um so this one is is Indiana Jones having to to cope with with snakes that he doesn't like that okay, I'm around something that really, really scares me, but I know what it is. I know how to handle this. It's a specific trigger that is setting off a mask that I know how to, to roll out. It's, a, it's an old familiar mask. I can just put on without thinking because that particular thing has triggered that, that response. Your ingrained masking is something that is, is very, very similar to the military. Um, that automatic habit of you see a senior officer you do a salute it's a you don't have to think about it it's such a learned habit that it, it's not the same as that subconscious trigger it's something that you've had to make ingrained as you go along so it didn't start out as an automatic thing but you've interacted with that trigger so many times now that it's become a force of habit and that, that can sometimes be the hardest one to break because it's really ingrained in your, your brain, in your processes, that that's what you do. And then the, the fourth style of masking, which is, is your sort of your conscious preemptive masking. It's the one where you, you look at a situation, you go, this is going to be tough. This is what I've got to do. OK, let's get myself ready. Let's, let's put on all my makeup. Let's put on the mask very actively 
before I brace myself and go into that situation. So it is a very similar to getting into character if you're acting in a film, putting on all of that stage makeup and being right, this is the person I am now who can cope with this situation. So there's a four different types of masking and each of them have different types of impacts on people in terms of mental health, in terms of understanding your own identity. Thanks, Helen. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about some of the academic research that we've summarised in the book, um, and I'm not going to throw a bunch of studies at you, so don't worry, um, but talk a little bit about, as, as Felicity said, the academic world is starting to catch up a bit with autistic people's conversations about masking. Um, and so this is just, yeah, summarising what we kind of can, can back up with scientific evidence. Um, so thinking about who actually masks. There haven't been that many sort of systematic studies, but in, in one study that we conducted, 94% um, of the autistic adults who responded to the study said that they had masked at some point in their lives. Um, so it could be that they were currently masking, it could be that it was something that they had done in the past but didn't do now, or it could be something that they developed later on in life. Um, but it's important to remember within that statistic that there are some people who say that either they don't know how to mask, um, or they've never tried to, or they've never wanted to. So although masking seems to be something that's common to many, many autistic people, not everyone does mask. Um, and as part of that, we don't know very much about people who don't mask, um, because unsurprisingly, we tend not to ask them to take part in research about masking. Um, so most of the research that we've done so far has focused on autistic adults without intellectual disability, um, which means we really don't know very much about how um, people with intellectual disability or with limited spoken language might mask, the ways in which they might do it, um, and the different situations. So that's an area where we're, we're really kind of still a little bit lost in terms of what we can say. Um, and another thing to point out is that most of the research in this area has been really focused on Western cultures. So most of it takes place in Europe, um, in North America and in Australia. So we really don't know much about how people mask in other cultures, uh, particularly places where attitudes to autism and masking might be different. Um, so that's something to bear in mind when we're thinking about the research and the experiences we're talking about. They are very much focused on predominantly white, predominantly Western cultures. Um, and then finally, thinking about the, the kind of research so far, we don't know very much about masking in children. So as I said, most of the research has focused on adults. There's a bit of research looking at adolescents as well. And we know that many autistic adults talk about masking from very early on in life. So we know sort of anecdotally that autistic children do mask, but we don't really have much evidence um, or research into when masking develops, how it develops, and um, particularly thinking about the impacts that it might have across, across the lifespan. So as we'll go on to discuss, we know that there are significant impacts on mental health, but we don't know at what point in development those might start um, appearing and, and when we can kind of best intervene to reduce those negative outcomes for autistic people. Next slide, please, Helen. Thank you. So why do autistic people mask? Um, I'm just going to sum up a few of the kind of broad explanations that we gathered from the people that we talked to. So we interviewed many autistic people for this book, as well as the research that we put together and um, the real life experiences that Helen's put throughout the book. Um, so I think one of the main kind of ways to sum up why autistic people mask um, is because the characteristics that autistic people express because of their autism are seen sometimes as negative because they're different to neurotypical social expectations. So put simply, being different is often seen as being bad uh, by neurotypical society. And so that can lead to stigma or to ne negative reactions around autistic behaviours. So just because someone looks different, they can be thought of as not good enough or having to change in order to fit in. And those kinds of reactions or, or messages from society can be very explicit. So they could be things like a child being told that they need to make eye contact when they're talking to a teacher or even a small child being sort of taught to make eye contact, even if that's something that naturally they wouldn't want to do. Um, or they could be messages that are learned very implicitly without someone even being aware of it. 
So the, the kind of analogy that I like to think of is like the sunflower following the sun. So the sunflower isn't aware that it's changing the direction that it faces to follow the sun, but it's still following that positive reinforcement or moving away from the negative reinforcement of the, the lack of light in order to follow the sun and have more positive outcomes. So that's the way that I like to describe how masking can be both very conscious and learned, something that's practiced over a long period of time, or it can be done without someone even um, being aware of it. So you could have someone who doesn't even realize that they're autistic or, or know that they're autistic, but still tries to mask and tries to change their behaviors um, in order to, to sort of be more accepted by other people. Um, and again, that could be in ways that, that they're not even aware of. So if I could have the next slide. So to kind of sum up all of that, the reasons why autistic people often mask is just a response to other people or to society, either not accepting the way that autistic people behave or feeling like the autistic person is behaving in a way that doesn't meet other people's expectations. So there's some kind of disconnect between the way that the autistic person is and the way that the environment expects or needs them to be. Um, so I think this quotation that we've shown here is really great because it demonstrates that a lot of the time things being different um, can make people feel uncomfortable. And if someone has to change their behavior, often it will be the autistic person that is expected to, to change their behavior. And that can then lead to sort of trying to hide feelings of difference or feelings of discomfort to avoid that negative reaction. Um, and, and in some cases, even, even kind of hiding away from other people. So the example that um, Helen's given here, which I think is great, is Hermione's response in the first Harry Potter book or film um, to sort of not being accepted by her peers um, is changing her behavior. So she runs away and hides in a toilet and sort of pretends that she's not feeling upset and frustrated. Um, and, you know, I think that's partly because she she's really struggling in this new environment. There are new rules that she doesn't understand, even though she's very clever and hardworking the kind of social side that maybe is a bit more difficult and I'm not necessarily saying that I think Hermione is autistic I think that's a whole area of different debate um, but I think it's a really good example of, of how everyone does this to some extent and we, we talk about this in the book in more detail the kind of similarities and differences between autistic masking and non-autistic changing of behavior um, but it demonstrates that that can really occur across a range of, of different situations. So I'm going to hand back to Helen now to tell us a little bit more about why autistic people mask. Thanks. Uh, okay, so when we're looking at particular situations that autistic people mask in, um, I'm just going to give you a few examples here, which are also using some, some personal examples from my life. So one of the first reasons that, that we might mask is when we're trying to fit in when we're very aware that a group of people, particularly a group of people that we may want to be interacting with, so friends or colleagues in the workplace, are acting in a specific way, we will try to adapt and be a part of that group. However, as this image from the film Mean Girl shows, we don't always get it quite right. She's understood that the colour pink is important, hasn't quite got the same style of clothing yet as the other girls. So she's trying to fit in she's trying to adapt and mask and become one of that group but hasn't quite made it there yet we mask when we're very nervous but we don't want to show it um, every time i do a talk whether it's in person or one of these i'm very much trying not to show just how scared i am because i'm wanting to project confidence in what i'm saying because if i don't look confident in what i'm saying why should anyone believe what i'm saying we mask when we're trying to convince ourselves and others that we're okay, that we're coping. Um, a great scene from, from Friends is Ross Geller very much, I'm fine. Everyone knows he's not, but he is desperately trying to convince himself and everyone around him that no, he is okay. He's coping, it's not a problem. But that's very much a mask that isn't working, everyone is seeing through it. Sometimes we just need to hold things together to get away from a bad situation. So again, another one that's taken from, from Harry Potter, everyone's staring, everyone has got a very negative vibe at this point, because uh, this is the scene where the, the name came out of the Goblet of Fire. 
everyone is is very much angry with him at this point and he's just got to get out the room just just hold it together long enough to figure out what's going on what he's got to do next because it's a very very scary situation and then there are times that we mask desperately when we don't want to show people that we are upset or have been upset People that know me might be able to tell in this photo that I have just been crying my eyes out in meltdown, but I've dragged my mask back together because I don't want to show this famous person that I am very much in awe of how upset I've been because I really want a nice photo. This is a World Cup winner. This is someone who I have desperately been wanting to meet for years. So when I got the opportunity, I'm going to really try and hide the fact that I have literally just been in the, the lose, bawling my eyes out. So in all sorts of different situations, we will find that we are needing to mask in order to not let on exactly how we're feeling about a situation. But this has a big impact on us. We find that actually it's a lot of effort to, to mask. This is a, a great quote from, from the book that we use that talks about someone finally understanding how much effort it, it takes for us to mask every day. And one of the analogies I like to use around masking is, is talking about the character Clark Kent, Superman. Now, for most superheroes, the mask they put on is the superhero mask, the, the Spider-Man, the Batman, the Iron Man. For Clark Kent, that is his mask because he's trying not to show the world that he is an alien, that he is different to the rest of us. And the mask he adopts is unassuming, someone who blends into the background, who is forgotten easily, the slightly hunched over, the glasses, the not showing just how strong he is because he knows that will identify him as different. So he suppresses all of those things about him to try and put on this, this camouflaging mask of being what he thinks normal humanity looks like. But it's a lot of work. And he is constantly finding this battle between being who he really is, which is the person that the comics come to know as Superman, and this character that he has to keep going to keep this normal day-to-day -day life happening. One of the other analogies that, that comes up quite often with the impact masking has on people is around what's called sort of the blue screen of death when it comes to computing. Too much has been happening for too long on that PC and it's just crashed. It's gone, can't do it anymore. Giving up, need a break. Everything has fallen apart. And actually, when you're masking heavily in a social situation, it is a lot like having lots of things happening at once on a computer or a smartphone. You might actually find the smartphone starts to, to heat up and the battery is disappearing and, and it just can't last. Sooner or later, you either need to get out of that situation and shut a few things or the whole thing is going to crash on you. And it really can feel like a, a crash when it happens to you as a person when masking has gone on too long and you can't cope anymore, your brain just shuts down and says, no, nope, not having any of it anymore, need to go to sleep, need to rest, need to get away from this situation. And that can be really, really hard to cope with. These are some uh, quotes from the book about sort of what autistic people think about masking. Now, we had so many possible quotes we could have used in this slide. But these three are ones that I, I really think pinpoint what we're trying to express with this book. Um, so one person was talking about the fact that even in a room full of other autistic people, they feel like they have to be the person who stays masking in order to help everyone else in the room, to, to lead the group project, to be the one that takes control of different elements of what's happening. And I must admit, I, I agree with this quote. I find particularly in the workplace, even though I'm, I'm known to be autistic because I'm leading the autistic colleagues group, because I'm leading a particular project on something, I still feel like I have to mask a lot of my instinctive reactions in order to support everyone else in the room. And that can be really, really tough because 
it comes back to the, the whole analogy of who cares for the carers. Sometimes you need to be the one that is told, no, it's OK, you go take a break you go do what you need to do to cope with this situation. Uh, the quote from uh, Camilla Pang from her book that, that we refer to in our book is, is very, very relevant. It is exhausting. You end up feeling, if you are masking too much, that you're only ever projecting a different personality and you're not actually showing your own. And then you lose access to things that make you happy the things that you find joy in if you're always trying to suppress that element of yourselves and you end up just acting your whole life as another person so do people know who you are do people like you for you or actually do they like this false projection you're putting out all the time and then the final quote um this is from someone who didn't actually mask very much before they got their diagnosis but after being clinically diagnosed and doing a bit of research into autism, found out that actually there is a specific way they can mask in order to make life just a little bit more simple, to have a few less issues socially with people, to get through life just that little bit more easily. And I think that's a really important point to make, that there will be times we choose to mask because we want the easier element of that social activity. Yes, it will cost us, but actually sometimes it's easier to do it that way round than to not mask and have to deal with all the consequences of what other people think and react to what we're doing. And that I suppose is, is the key point we, we wanted to sort of finish these slides on is to think about when you're advising an autistic person on masking or when you are an autistic person yourself thinking about should you mask in a situation or not it's about thinking about the reasons behind your choices so this image is from disney's mulan film she's been masking very heavily trying to be the, the classic girl in this situation of, of doing all the the makeup and the pouring the tea and she's realizing that's just not her she can't do that but in that moment she's split between what is expected of her and what she wants to do so when you're thinking about whether to mask or not in a situation you need to be thinking about what is expected of you yes but what will make you happy in the situation now sometimes you might find that trying to mask in a situation holds you back because actually you're not you're not being true to yourself and you find it difficult to, to lie that much, essentially. And actually, it's a situation where people should be understanding of your need to not mask. People should be OK with the fact that everyone has different views and different needs. And sometimes if you mask too much your own pain and struggles, that holds everyone back because no one understands that adaptions need to be made. But on the flip side there are times actually a mask is exactly what you need to push through a situation just like a lot of people first thing in the morning will have a cup of coffee to get them up and going and caffeinated or we take painkillers to, to mask physical pain and keep us going for a little while sometimes we just need that that short little mask to get through a situation and then once we're through it we can relax and let it go again so ultimately, it comes down to your own personal decision about do you want to show that raw honesty of your authentic self and then deal with the potential consequences? Or is it the sort of situation where actually it's a strategic use of a mask and go, just for a little bit, I'm going to hide for now, I'm going to put the mask in place, but I'm going to have an exit strategy for when that mask comes down and I say, nope. I'm now at the point of going back to this is the authentic me. So it's always thinking about that, that balance between the situation you're in, how much energy you've got as to how long you can keep that mask going for, and your own confidence level about who is around you that might be able to, to support you in that situation. So there's lots of different factors so that there is no one guidance to masking or not masking. 
but it is very much thinking about all of those different factors. We will start going through all of your questions. And as I said at the start, if we don't manage to get to, to everyone's, then uh, our speakers have kindly agreed to follow up via email for something we can put onto our blog. So um, the first question that we've had in is actually a question that quite a few people have come through to us on. Um, and uh, Felicity, I wonder if I can start with you. The question is around how autistic masking differs to non-autistic masking, because obviously all of us in certain circumstances would consider ourselves to wear masks of different sorts. And I know you cover this specifically in the book on the differences. Yes, we did. Um, so we've actually got a couple of places where we've almost written um, accounts of, ma of, of masking between me and Laura and between Helen to look at the differences in specific situations, so things like um, at a conference day, for example, which we all do as part of our jobs. I think, um, the, I think the easiest way to sum up that difference is that it's a quality and a quantity thing. So although I may very much feel like right now or at a conference, I'm sort of putting on my, my best kind of professional image and my most professional behavior that doesn't actually change how I feel about who I am um, at the core of myself um, in a way that the persistent and lifelong masking that autistic people feel they need to do really can do and can really impact their their core sense of their identity particularly because for autistic masking so much of what you are masking are your natural um, instincts, your natural reactions to the world around you, um, because you're getting the message that those things are inappropriate or wrong. And so it can really undermine how people feel about themselves. And that's why it has such an impact on mental health. Um, the kind of situational masking or performance that non-autistic people do, I think doesn't tend to have that same uh, impact, isn't so long lasting, um, and doesn't tend to be quite so global. It does tend to be about those specific situations. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, Laura? No, I don't think so. I think you summed it up perfectly. It's the, it's the kind of quality and the quantity that are different. And yeah, I think at a, at a very basic level, I think some of the characteristics are the same between autistic masking and, and non-autistic impression management, self-presentation, whatever you want to call it. But I do think fundamentally it comes down to autistic masking is about masking of autistic characteristics. So you can be an autistic person and still, you know, put on a professional face, mm. but it might involve different strategies and a lot more effort than for a, a non-autistic person. Did you want to add anything, Helen? I think the, the one other thing there is also the, the impact. So, mm. um, all three of us are engaging in some form of professional masking today because we're presenting ourselves. I would imagine for Laura and Felicity in a couple of hours time, they might still have those residual, I was nervous about something, but for me, it will last a lot longer because not only will I then be dealing with everything I've suppressed this whole time, but there is also all the external elements of still just being autistic, still having sensory differences still having all of those elements coming into play um so yeah I think for us it it's how much longer some of it can last and you know people talk about sort of autistic fatigue and that sort of too much peopling impact the longer you have to wear a mask the longer it takes you to recover from it we've also had a couple of questions around um autistic children and masking um one of them was specifically is it possible for children to mask um and secondly whether or not there's been much research into autistic children and masking so it's a very good question and i think the logical one after we spent a lot of time talking about autistic adults the simple answer is yes autistic children definitely can mask we know 
of autistic children who have told us this. We know of parents of autistic children. We know autistic adults who say, I masked when I was a child. Having said that, there's almost no research actually looking into this. Um, so a research project that I'm currently working on at the University of Bristol with Felicity um, is just trying to understand a bit more about what does masking look like for autistic children and young people. So can we kind of assume that the ways that we understand masking for adults applies to children? It could be that the way children mask is very different. So the methods that we're using to measure it need to be different. And then also sort of starting to think about, as I said earlier, the, the longer term consequences of masking for children. And is there a way that we can kind of try and interrupt that and maybe develop kind of interventions at a, a more school or society based level? So autistic children ideally would never feel the need to mask unless it's something that they're choosing to do. Um, so, yeah, to summarize that. Currently, there is very little research, but we know it's something that does happen and it's something that we're really kind of passionate about doing more research on in the future. Um, from a personal perspective, it is absolutely possible to, to mask as a child. Um, obviously, when you're growing up, you learn a lot from your parents, from siblings that are around you. And as you're learning in general about walking, talking, eating, going to school, you are picking up from people around you what is expected what is wanted um you know once you've achieved what your parents want they will congratulate you and stop encouraging you so that's the signal to go ah I've got this right but if they keep pushing you that that's a sign that something isn't isn't correct you you haven't met that expectation yet um I know slightly different from from autistic masking that they're there is a lot of understanding out there in the world about trauma and about um, children who've grown up in homes of alcoholics learning to very early on take on those personas of, sort of the golden child, the distraction, those different elements, because at a very young age, children can recognise when there is sort of a danger around them, when there is that, that fear response. Um, and at the heart of it, a lot of masking starts with with some kind of trauma, with knowing that, oh, I don't want to be seen to be different. I don't want to get this wrong. And, and that's often where it starts. Not at all saying that all autistic children grow up in, in trauma environments. I didn't. But the trauma can come from an older cousin taking the mick out of you for getting something wrong. The trauma can come from seeing your mum cry because there's been an argument at a very, very young age, anything can start to, to create that, that trauma response. Um, and ultimately, you know, when we're talking about parents encouraging children to mask at a young age, even if they don't mean to, all of that relates back to the fact that parents are there to help children become adults, to help them survive in the world we exist in. And at the moment, we exist in a world where unfortunately masking does does have to happen still um, so actually it's it's not bad parenting to teach your child how to mask as long as you're teaching them strategic masking and that they should always be making the choice over whether they mask or not um, in the same way as we make choices every day about what clothes to wear you know we could all decide to, to go out the house naked if we really wanted to that's a society-based choice that we've decided the consequences of doing that aren't worth it. So it's, it's always thinking about when we're helping others mask, we're doing it for the right reasons. There's a really good follow-up question to that, which is um, how can we advocate for our daughters and I suppose um, sons as well, if their mask is so fixed at school and I guess so successful at school that the school doesn't see any issues? Yeah, this is something that comes up a lot when I'm talking to parents, particularly of girls, but it, it can be true for boys as well. And I think that's something we emphasise throughout the book, that masking is not a gendered phenomenon. It's just that we see that girls and women report doing more of it or more in more situations. Um, in terms of trying to help any child take the mask off at school, particularly if it's working for them at the moment, that's going to be really difficult for them. 
because that means opening yourself up to being vulnerable to not doing well at school effectively or you know getting very upset having a meltdown which is not something that anybody wants to go through and particularly children and young people don't want to go through in front of their peers who they are desperate to be accepted by um so i think kind of in helen's response i also i almost don't know whether it is helpful to teach a child that they need to open themselves up to that at school simply to get school to agree i think it's probably best to find other ways to get school to see their behaviors at home perhaps um to, to create the evidence that I assume is what's being looked for is evidence to get school to support an application to an educational psychologist or for a, a support plan. Um, that's normally when people contact me about this. Um, I think it's better to try and find other ways of getting that evidence than putting a child in the situation where they're going to have been deeply distressed in a space where they have to go five days a week, you know, at least nine till three and be with those other with be with those peers having had that experience i think sometimes it's also about looking for the evidence in non normal school so making sure the teachers are specifically observing what happens on a non uniform day on a day just before the end of term where lessons aren't being followed on a school trip particularly the days following a school trip or if you've got a sort of a a week away somewhere where actually that child is going to need support because they're not going to be able to keep that mask going the whole five weeks of a trip ab abroad in France or something. Um, but making sure the teachers go in knowing what they're observing is likely to be autistic masking and then it's not written off as oh it's they've just had a row with their best friend they're going through puberty the usual excuses that get trotted out when people don't want to acknowledge that it, that it is autism. Um, so it's about making sure that, that teachers have that understanding before they then do that observation. Um, but yeah, we, we, don't, we don't want to ever see children having to go through something traumatic in order to prove to others what's going on. Um, but it might be the case of thinking of letting the child know that actually yes you mask around your peers you mask in the class you mask at lunchtime but maybe once a week you go see a trusted member of staff in the school and you you drop the mask you talk to them honestly um we don't really have sort of school counselors over here like they do in america but but that kind of thing of have one named person that once a week you go and just you ask all the questions that have been confusing you all week. You, you talk through what's going on and, and a bit like how in university you have sort of a, a support tutor, get that going at an earlier age and get a trusted member of staff who can see that side, who can then explain it to their peers in the staff room as to what's going on. One question uh, that's, that's come in, in fact, two sort of related, which I'm particularly interested in uh, as a non-autistic person in the workplace is talking about how, what advice can you give, um, what tips can you give for non-autistic people to advocate for and support autistic people to feel that they, they don't need to mask as much either in the workplace or, or other situations and what what supports can be put in place um, and indeed based on a lot of what you've just been saying should we be encouraging autistic people to drop their masks or should we are there other things that we can do to support autistic people that to to mask in the way that they would prefer to mask for example <laughs> I'll give Helen a minute to kind of plan her answer. Yeah. This is this is very much her her special area. Um, I think with adults, it's a slightly different situation to children because adults are much more able generally to advocate for themselves um, around the mask. So kind of adults, I think generally are more able to 
choose when they are masking and not because they've kind of gone through that developmental stage that children and young people are often still working everything out. Um, I think often putting reasonable adjustments in place for other aspects of somebody's autistic profile, things like uh, sensory sensitivities, so offering natural light instead of being right under the bright strip lights or um, offering somebody the quiet corner of the office, things like that, or making clear that they can wear noise cancelling headphones. I think if you make it clear that those kinds of accommodations are normal, are respected, are not something that anybody else in the office is kind of making an issue out of, you make it clear that your workplace is friendly for neurodivergent people and that creates an environment where people can start to feel comfortable dropping other bits of their mask because they know that that is understood generally in the, in the setting. Um, so I think it's about general acceptance leading to people feeling comfortable dropping other bits of the mask that they don't necessarily need to keep up if they know that they're in a safe space. That doesn't necessarily mean that they will stop masking entirely all day, every day at work, but it means that they're in a position to choose almost what level that they need or they feel they need at different points in time. I think there's very much an element of we need to normalise needs. Mm -hmm. It's not just autistic people that have needs for reasonable adjustments. Um, you know, there's, there's reasonable adjustments in the workplace for parents being able to leave to do the school run. There's reasonable adjustments for anyone that's that's got um, an allergy or a food intolerance. There, there are all sorts of reasonable adjustments that get in, put in place for people without us specifically labelling them a reasonable adjustment. And I think non-autistic co-workers can support an autistic co-worker by normalising talking about their own needs, talking about the fact that they may be struggling with something and that actually sometimes we all just need a space to, to go and scream at the sky. Um, I think it's, it's, it can depend on what the workplace is as to how possible it is to, to do certain things. Um, I personally am a big fan of the way that the, the military approach a lot of stuff. So you've got a very rigid kind of, you must respect your senior officer, you're in uniform, you do all of this. But then you you go back to the barracks, you have shore leave where you can really blow out and just be yourself for a while. They have very good ways of looking at how to manage those stress levels because they understand the psychology of having to operate at a really high level for a while and needing to just go chill out, be yourself. Um, I think we, particularly in terms of offices and, and the nine to five approach, we need to get better at realising if people are commuting into an office, they need to be able to get there and spend the first 10, 15 minutes doing whatever they need to, to put aside everything that's happened on that journey. Um, you know, I think we need to get better at making sure that there are proper break rooms in workplaces that people can go and, and they don't get taken over by meetings because you can't find a meeting room that they are somewhere you can just go and listen to music for a bit, to make yourself some breakfast or a snack, to have space away from everyone else before you then go and, and start the, the main bulk of your job. Um, I think we also need to get a lot better, and, and we have, uh, thanks to the pandemic sort of forcing us, at realising we need that balance between there will be some days you need to not work in the office, some days you need a different adaptation um, and really thinking about how people can support each other and it, it's not always about saying the autistic person needs to not answer the phones they need to leave early they need to start late actually doing a little bit of what well, okay they need that but how can they then support another colleague by going actually you're really really good at checking and spotting mistakes can you audit this person's work at the end of the week as a little bit of a give and take there. So actually the other colleagues don't then end up resenting the autistic person for having adjustments in place because it's a give and take thing where they get something back from it. Um, again, all of that is quite focused around sort of office-based nine to five roles, 
when you're looking at shift work, it's perhaps talking to the rotor coordinator and making sure that they know you can't ask that person to pull a double. They're the person that is like last on the list for emergency cover if they've just worked. Factoring those sort of sides of things into it. If you're in the kind of role where it's perhaps emergency services or something, knowing that actually the autistic response to what has happened might be delayed. So a non-autistic person who's working as a paramedic goes to a very stressful situation. It's all very distressing and traumatic. They might straight away need some time off, need some space. The autistic person might actually be absolutely fine to begin with, want to push on and carry on. And then the response comes a couple of days later. So it's always thinking about that side of things that you might see a delayed reaction because they've kept the mask on because it's glued in place and you need to wait until they're ready for it to come down and have that reaction. So, yeah, there's a lot of different sort of factors and elements going on there. Thank you so much. Um, that's all we've got time for today. Um, thank you so much for all of your questions. They do allow us to dig so much deeper into to what we've been talking about throughout the, the webinar. And as I said at the start, Felicity, Laura and Helen uh, have all said they're happy to follow up um, with the questions that we haven't managed to get to this afternoon. Um, and we'll publish those at a later date um, on the Autistica blog. So you can keep an eye out for that on our social media channels across Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. If you want to get your hands on a copy of Autism and Masking, it's available from all good bookshops and probably some bad ones as well. Um, speaking of which, the authors would like to encourage you to pick up paperback copies from Waterstones. Although if you want an ebook version, it is only currently available on Kindle. Uh, we have had a question pop up about audio books. I don't believe it exists as an audio book right now. Are there any plans for it to be an audio book? Uh, we would like it to be, but that's a whole new set of conversations with the publishers. So it's taking a little while to work out the possibilities. <laughs> Excellent. Well, there is definitely a demand for it. We've seen in the in the questions in the chat um, throughout today. Um, if you found this webinar useful, please consider making a small donation to Autistica by visiting autistica.org.uk. I nearly got our own website wrong then. Um, or donating directly through Facebook if you're watching this there. On our website, you can also sign up to hear about our future webinars and the latest in autism research, including how you can get involved. All that's left for me to say is a huge thank you to Felicity, Laura and Helen for sharing your work with us today and for answering so many of the questions uh, so thoughtfully. Um, it's been a genuine pleasure uh, to have you here with us. So thank you. Thank you so much.